First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the rule of law in the Supreme Court. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. That's my beat. And 2024 is already exhausting. This past week, in an order that explained nothing, the highest court in the land ruled by a five to four margin on the issue we talked about on last week's show with Rochelle Garza, Who gets to set immigration policy, the federal government or the state of Texas? The majority sided with the Biden administration for now, but the fact that there were four votes to give Greg Abbott the keys to border enforcement is a kind of chilling reminder of how deeply unmoored this court has become from precedent and constitutional thought. For the folks watching the New Hampshire primary this week to see whether the GOP could kick its Trump addiction, mm, no dice. And the question of whether a state can toss the former president off the ballot is careening up to the court for argument in less than two weeks. Meanwhile, jurors in a Manhattan courtroom determined that Donald Trump would have to pay more than $83 million for the harm caused by his defamation of E. Jean Carroll. That is another absolutely staggering win for the journalist and her legal team. One thing that we noticed watching this particular trial unfold over the last two weeks was the extent to which this legal battle stands completely apart from the rest of Trump's many, many trials about the insurrection and state secrets and his business practices, because this was a trial that was just very starkly about misogyny and sexual violence. And we wanted to flag this for you because it fits into a presidential election that is already very much about misogyny and violence towards women's bodies. We are going to talk about all that with Molly Jongfast, the sharp-eyed correspondent for Vanity Fair, who has been writing and thinking about what this second E. Jean Carroll lawsuit means for Americans, and particularly for American women. Later on in the show, our Slate Plus listeners are going to get to hear from the great Mark Joseph Stern on that 5-4 ruling from the court on the Texas border case. We're also going to check in with him on the horrors of this past week's death penalty decisions. My conversation with Mark is available exclusively to our Slate Plus members. If you would like to join their ranks and access ad-free versions of all of Slate's podcasts, enjoy unlimited reading at slate.com and listen to bonus segments here on Amicus, but also across Slate's network of shows, including the Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, please go to slate.com slash amicus plus to sign up. That's slate.com slash amicus plus. And to our cherished Slate Plus listeners, thank you, thank you for your support. We genuinely could not do the breakneck legal journalism we're trying to do on the show and at the magazine without you. We appreciate you more than ever. Thanks. So there was a whole lot of something happening over these past two weeks in the Manhattan federal courtroom where Donald Trump opted this time to attend his second defamation trial. This was the very first time that Eugene Carroll had confronted him in a courtroom. 
Since the sexual abuse and defamation had already been established in the first trial, the only issue for the jury this time was the price tag, which, as we now know, stands at over $83 million. Now, of course, as soon as Donald Trump entered the building, in some sense, the law had to take a backseat to his big old clown shoes. Since the trial began, Trump has continued lashing out in social media posts on CNN, on the campaign trail, and of course with 37 posts in just one night on Truth Social. Ultimately, he testified for about mm, three minutes on Thursday, and that testimony was anticlimactic, and big chunks of it were actually stricken from the record. So in keeping with our pledge to treat these Trump lawsuits as serious legal events, we are not here to dunk solely on Alina Haba's terrible lawyering, despite the fact that it's been eminently dunkable. What we want to think about is what this second E. Jean Carroll trial says about women, the former president, the law, and the upcoming election. And there is nobody better on that front than my friend and fellow scribbler Molly Jong Fast. Molly is a special correspondent for Vanity Fair. She is the host of the podcast Fast Politics. She's written for The Atlantic and Rolling Stone and every place else in between. And she may be one of the last reasons I'm still lurking on Twitter slash X slash any social media at all. Molly, welcome to Amicus. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted. I'm just delighted. So, And I'm a listener. By the way, I'm a listener of your podcast. So you've followed my slow decline into despair <laughs> in recent years. Yes. Good, good. Um, and mirrored it. <laughs> and mirrored it. Um, so, okay, let's stipulate to two things. One, you are not a lawyer. I'm not, not going lawyer. to ask you to be one. Okay. Nope. And two, let's just stipulate that you and I both know E. Jean Carroll and... Uh, we know Robbie Kaplan, her attorney, yes. and uh, you, in fact, are being accused this week yes. of being the but-for cause of E. Jean and Robbie meeting because you and George Conway, anyway, Reed Hoffman, conspiracy, conspiracy. <laughs> so let's just yeah. agree that you know her. So, yep. yes, Donald Trump truced that in the court, during the questioning, Alina Haba asked... E. Jean, where she had met George Conway, and she had met George Conway through me. And so she said, I met him at a party at Molly Jong Fast's house. And Donald Trump, during his Wednesday night truth social binge, his truth social binge, he did, in fact, uh, truth that very exchange. So you're truth famous. Yes. So I found myself once again in this sort of very supporting role character of making Donald Trump crazy. So I wondered if we could start with a, a really poignant piece that you wrote last May for Vanity Fair after the Eugene Two trial, which was in fact the first trial for all the reasons I said above. You talked about all the ways in which that first E. Jean Carroll verdict was a really apt moment to think about the misogyny in the White House and how it gave so much cover to general misogyny in public life. And at the time, it's amazing, it was less than a year ago, you wrote that what Trumpism unleashed could not be contained when it comes to demeaning women. And I just want to quote from the piece. You said, even if Trump is forced to pay Carol great sums of money, she will spend the rest of her life afraid looking over her shoulder, worried. The vitriol and misogyny and hatred that Trump gave permission to won't ever be put back in Pandora's box. So so we're less than a year later, and we have a trial which, unlike last time, now Trump's in the room. I mean, he's actually glowering at her, and he's muttering, and the judge has to tell him to stop talking. All of the fear and menace you described in that piece last year is now happening in person in a courtroom. And I'd love for you to reflect on the difference, just how different it feels when it's not just that he gave permission to other people to threaten her, but he's actually sitting just a few feet away from her. Well, you know, it's funny because it's like there are two parts to Trumpism. One is this threats and intimidation, right? There's another Trump trial, the New York trial, where they are now going to have an anonymous jury. And that's the kind of thing they do when the jury is, is looking at an organized crime case, right? So 
this is a situation where the going against Trump is so scary and so dangerous that people are going to have to be protected with anonymity. So if you think about E. Jean, here's E. Jean, she's 80 years old. She's going against Trump because, I think, because, you know, nothing else, no one else has had been able to su- sort of successfully go against Trump, right? He has all of these allegations of sexual assault. I mean, I, so many so that I knew what my best friend from high school's mother was one of them. Like, so many, right? This is how many there are. And uh, and she came out to People Magazine, it didn't matter, right? I mean, she, she suffered and decided, you know, she was going to come out. And, you know, she alleges he touched her boob at her mother's funeral. And she, you know, she could, she decided to come out because she felt that she had to because she couldn't live with herself. And it didn't matter. You know, it, it didn't move the needle at all. So I think E. Jean is thinking if, it, you know, this is one of these situations where if it's not her, it will not be anyone. So I do think that um, there is a sense here in which she is really doing the kind of work that a person who really, that they, you know, she's really, it's quite scary. I mean, I don't know that I would do that if I were in that situation. I mean, it's an unknown unknown. Let's take a quick break to hear from some of our great sponsors. And now we want to pause to hear a quick message from our friends at SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI will not help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, Identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. We're going to pause for a moment to hear from our friends at SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. And now we are back with Vanity Fair's Molly Jongfast. I think that what you're highlighting, and it's the reason I wanted to talk to you, is that it's so easy to classify his conduct as sort of funny, right? And even the tone of voice with which we started this conversation is, look at his antics. Like, look at the crazy crap he's posting on Truth Social. Like, this is nuts, right? His lawyer is terrible. She's a real estate lawyer and a family lawyer. She doesn't understand criminal law, and the judge— had to explain to her how to put something into evidence, right? It's, there's got this, there's this component, Molly, of hilarity ensued. And then what you're saying, and I think it's just really something I wanted listeners to think about. He spent last week and this week glowering and glaring at her, glaring at her attorney, making faces at jurors, muttering so much that when the judge threatened eventually to toss him, you know, Trump was like, you know, please throw me out. Like, that's what I want. And I think that one of the things that's so strange is the fact that this is a split screen. For Trump, this is just comedy gold. It's performance gold. For E. Jean, she's 80. And she's sitting there in the scariest situation, and here's Alina Haba reading out loud threatening tweets at her. Yeah. I would add that e. Jean is a microcosm for 
Trump's misogyny. And I'm not even just talking about Trump's misogyny. I'm talking about, for example, I'm sure you saw this article about how there, the estimation is about 60,000 women in all of these states that will that have been victims of rape and gotten pregnant and had to have their rapist babies. Now, this is 12 states. The bans are in, I think, 14 states. I mean, this is, a, you know, over almost two years, a year and a half, because Texas started its abortion ban earlier than the rest. So maybe it's two years, two plus years. But anyway, the point is, that is tens of thousands of women being forced to have their rapist babies, right? So this is, Trumpism is funny. He says things like, and I use funny in quotes, he says things like, I wouldn't rape her. She's not even my type, right? And there's a way in which you can listen to that because we're so removed and say like, uh, uh. I mean, it's so misogynistic that it like strikes me to the core, but it is, you know, he'll say that, then he'll, He'll confuse, I mean, a great example, he confuses E. Jean with Marla in a photo, right? So obviously she is his type. But the point is, this misogyny, you pull back and it has real world consequences. And of course, all these consequences, like, yes, this is terrible for E. Jean, but E. Jean has, she's definitely going to get at least $5 million and probably more. She has Robbie. She has security. She has people around her. You know, you see her with a security guard putting her in a car. Whereas like the woman in Texas who just got raped, you know, who doesn't have the money or the time to take three days off from work, you know, is going to have her rapist baby. So like all of these things, I mean, that's the thing with Trumpism. It all, you know, it reverberates, right? Misogyny reverberates. It has real world consequences for people. And they're and they're not us, right? There are people who can't, who don't have podcasts and don't have platforms, who don't have the kind of agency we do. And so I feel more than ever, it's important for us to be able to talk for those women and to, you know, tell their stories as much as possible. And the idea that we're on the precipice of another one of these Trump presidencies, I mean, I think it's, I think the numbers are still going to be hard for him, but it's very scary in my mind. So I just want to clarify for listeners that what Molly's referencing here is a research letter that was published Wednesday in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine that estimated, you got the number right, 64,565 pregnancies have statistically likely been caused by rapes in the 14 states where abortion is banned. And it leads me to a piece you wrote this week, Molly, where you sort of, sort of the, an elegiac piece about the 51st, what would have been the 51st anniversary of Roe. And yet I think what you were trying to say is like, no, women have risen up, you know, and taken seriously, right? It's not a joke to them uh, against Trump and the GOP and the Supreme Court. But I wanted you to speak to the sort of countervailing narrative that is women are exhausted, Me Too sputtered out, everybody's numb, Biden is old, and bullies can't be beaten because, again, this this case is such a split screen, right, where there is a version of it that you've just described, which is an 80-year-old woman on behalf of the 26 other people who have described being se sexually assaulted, brazening it out in court and, and putting up with a second round of just unmitigated crap and bile from Trump's lawyers— and at the same time, the ways in which this feels like a joke and a laugh and ha, 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 here's President Trump, former President Trump, uh, cracking not just on Eugene this week, not just on Ra Robbie Kaplan, but on Nikki Haley. Which of the two stories is true? And if they're both true, just tell me which way you're tilting. But please tell me it's the optimistic version. I'm very optimistic. I actually think that and I don't even want to say optimistic. I don't think that people want this. And I think if you look at 23 and 22 and 20 and 18, you see that voters are actually smarter and less craven than a lot of the pundit class thinks, right? Like I will remind you before the midterms, 
pundits were saying, oh, Biden, silly old Biden, giving that speech about democracy. Nobody votes on democracy. People only vote on inflation. It's going to be a red wave. Okay, maybe that's true. No, they were wrong, right? They were totally wrong. It was not a red wave. The only places where Republicans really won were the places where Democrats really were asleep at the switch. Like in those five blue seats in New York state and those six or seven house seats in California. Like there was clearly democratic malfeasance there. That was not strength of Republicans. That was Democrats letting it go, like in Florida. But I am telling you, I do not think conventional wisdom is right here. And I think that people don't like it. And here's the thing, in 2016, Trump did something very smart. And I remember watching it and thinking, like, this guy is actually pretty smart. I mean, he's a sociopath, but he's smart. He's, he did this thing where he said, you know, I'm going to do this stuff for you. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to do this. And even though every one of us knew he couldn't do any of that stuff, right? He's not going to bring back coal. You can't bring back coal. It's too expensive. But even despite that, he was promising people something. And so people who were these, you know, the electorate shifted and these low frequency voters went out and voted for him because he said he was going to do stuff for them. Fast forward, he could not do that stuff. And I do not think that same dynamic exists. I really don't. And the thing that happened with Hillary that was really a problem was that she was bound by the conventional political world. She couldn't say, yes, I too will bring back coal because she knew she couldn't bring back coal. That's not a thing. And so I do think that it was like, I don't think that that same dynamic exists. Biden is old. Okay, thank you. Trump is also old. He's 77, 77 versus 81. This is not like 45 versus 81. And I think ultimately, I just am not convinced that, and even if you look historically, people tend not to vote. Voters tend not to be ageist. Now, that may be because they are old themselves, or that may be for whatever reason. But if you look historically, people don't not get elected because they're old. They don't get elected for other reasons, but that is not the reason. So I also think that we have to have a little more faith in the American people. You know, I think that they are sort of more with it than uh, the pundit class thinks. So I feel like we can't really talk about Trump and misogyny and the E. Jean Carroll trial that's unfolding without talking about <laughs> the person I said I didn't want to dunk on, his lawyer, Alina Haba, uh, his principal lawyer, only because from my point of view, there's something really profoundly sad about the substitution of Joe Tacopina, who was the lawyer last time. He bullied her. He was unbelievably aggressive. Backed out on this trial at the very last minute, intimating some break had happened with his client. We don't know what. It was Tacopina who advised Trump not to show up in Carol 2 and to be invisible. Clearly, that didn't work. Alina Haba is not the trial attorney he was, uh, but she's kind of the bully he was. And I feel like it signals something deeply sad about this moment in our politics that here's a woman viciously cross-examining the victim of what was de determined to be sexual abuse in ways that suggest maybe she kind of profited from it, right? She got on talk shows, says Haba. She did interviews. She gained more fame. And I wondered if you would speak to maybe that and the intersection between that and Nikki Haley, who's giving interviews saying she actually just doesn't either understand or care that Donald Trump is on trial again for sexual assault. Why are these women... <laughs> carrying water for a man they know to be an adjudicated sexual assailant. I read this piece by Moira Donegan, and this was like, why do white women support Trump, right? Because they identify more with the white than the woman, right? They think they'd rather be part of the, they'd rather be sort of on the winning side of oppression. And so they consider themselves to be the same as white men, which in fact they are not. So 
I think that is the, if you were to like put a finer point on this phenomenon as a social phenomenon, that's what it is. What Alina Habas, you know, I mean, again, one of the things that Trump does is he finds people who would never, ever, ever, ever be in a position like this because they don't have any talent or don't have any, like, usually if a president was in a court case, you would have an Ivy League lawyer trained to the hilt, charging, you know, $1,200 an hour representing them. But because this is Trump and he can't get any of those people, it is an enormous opportunity. Alina Hava would never be in this situation were it not for Donald Trump. And so that's how Donald Trump, I think, gets a lot of people as he says, you know, you would never be working in the White House. I mean, I remember in the 20, you know, when he's filling that White House, he's filling the White House with people who would never have even gotten clear. You know, I mean, just the sort of the kind of C, D, E level people. And, you know, for them, it's an opportunity for wealth and fame in a way that it wouldn't otherwise be. And look, there's a whole cottage industry of people who worked in that administration, then made money, uh, then went against it, sure, whatever, wrote books about it, and now have TV jobs. You know, if you're ambitious enough, you're will, uh, I think there's a willingness there to do whatever. And And most people are not thinking about, you know, the woman in Texas who can't get an abortion because... Trump has put together a Supreme Court that the Federal Society told him to. We will be right back after this quick break. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. And now we are back with Vanity Fair's Molly Jongfast. Sophie Gilbert had a really smart piece in The Atlantic this week that kind of talked about the contagion of the Trump misogyny. And and the point that she was making, I think I'll just read you the quote. She said, quote, the MAGA Republican Party is evermore a boys club. All 14 representatives who announced bids to become House Speaker after the ouster of Kevin McCarthy were men. The victor, Mike Johnson, has blamed Roe v. Wade in the past for depriving the country of, quote, able-bodied workers to prop up the American economy. Online and off, she writes, old-fashioned sexist and trollish provocateurs alike have been emboldened by Trump's ability to say grotesque things without consequence. And I'd love for you to reflect on, you know, I'm just sitting here remembering when we thought that Access Hollywood grab him by the pussy tape was going to be determinative, right? Like we thought that might decide the 2016 election. We are 100 miles past that, not just in terms of what we tolerate from Trump, but what we tolerate in our politics and the ways in which open misogyny, the kind of misogyny we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago, is just everywhere. And I guess I'm curious, Molly, if you think either a huge money damages award in this trial or Nikki Haley giving Trump a run for his money, is anything going to put this crap back into the bottle? Or are we going to just live in this creepy world of trolly men for the foreseeable political future? So I would say two things. One is the only way to defeat Trumpism, it looks like, is just to keep beating him. There was a moment when Republicans could have voted to convict, could have banned him from ever running for office again. In that moment, uh, we would have had a completely different 24, right? Maybe Nikki Haley versus Joe Biden. Maybe Joe Biden wouldn't eat. I mean, who even knows what it looked like? But uh, Republicans refused to do that because they were scared of exactly what E. Jean Carroll is going through right now. You know, even Mitt Romney, who has millions and millions of dollars, didn't want to spend the money on security. I mean, he voted to convict, but he's leaving the Senate. So, like, these people, 
it is quite scary to go against Trump. And I think that's worth thinking about. I think that the only way to put this in the bottle is going to be to beat him. You have to remember, all of this started because this was a uh, Republican's last stand against a multiracial democracy. And so th- we are living through a kind of the death now of a kind of racism that may continue on, but we'll have more and more trouble thriving. And so I think if we keep that in perspective, I think that there's that's sort of hopeful. And uh, I, I don't think Trump can be stopped. And I don't think there's a dollar amount that will stop him because I don't think he totally understands how consequences work. Otherwise, he would stop defaming her while he's on trial for defamation, right? I mean, that is a kind of insane thing to think about. Like, here's a person defaming someone while on trial for defamation. On his second trial for defamation, after it's been established that he defames people. I I guess maybe you answered this question up at the top, but I wanted to land on this question of what you just said, which is he's just a, like, misogyny juggernaut who gives permission to other misogynists to create slipstream misogyny in his wake. What does a win look like for E. Jean? And I feel like what you're saying is the fact that she is sitting there, like, ramrod straight in court (laughs) is the win. That's the win. The win is money. I mean, the more money she can get, I think, the better, because the more he will have to pay her, right? Just the mechanics of, like, him having to pay her. Now, will he pay her or will one of his many donors who doesn't want to have to pay estate tax pay her? I don't know. But someone will pay her or they'll pay some extent of the payment. Look, I don't believe that E. Jean, I think she didn't feel she had a choice. I think she did what she felt she had to do. And we all owe her a huge debt of gratitude, in my mind. How long do any of us live, right? 90, 100? I mean, if it were the last or second to last decade of my life, would I want to spend it sitting in court again, you know, getting death threats from MAGA 1, 2, 3? No. And I'm not sure anything is worth that. So it's one thing to say she has security, which she does, but it's like we only have so much time on this planet. And that, for me, would be a very tough sell. So I do owe her, I feel as a woman, we owe her a huge debt of gratitude. Yeah, and I think maybe, you know, before I say goodbye, I also want to just note that what you're giving voice to, I think— really embodies how so many women are experiencing this trial and how they experienced the last trial. And it's, right, it, it's it's got that muscle memory of the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, right, which is this is a deeply intimate, right, a secret that one keeps for decades, a deeply painful and traumatic personal event that gets kind of warped into something really, really foul and that the public all has an opinion on without knowing anything. And that I think we sit there and we watch it and it's the opposite of comedy. It's it's tragedy. Yes. And also I would add there is something so incredibly bleak about the way the Trump world has processed the Brett Kavanaugh situation, right? They believe that their guy won it, that their guy, you know, that Brett was exonerated. And now Brett Kavanaugh sits on the Supreme Court, right? You'll remember the woman who testified against him. She was in an, I don't know if she's still in hiding, but she was for a year. I mean, her life has been completely change beyond recognition. And, uh, you know, we have seen again and again, the women who have gone out and told their story have ended up having very, they have not had great happy endings. 
Molly Jong Fast is a special correspondent for Vanity Fair. She is host of the podcast Fast Politics. And in her previous lives, she has written books and articles uh, and written for so many places. Uh, and she is, I think I want to say, uh, again, one of the only reasons I'm still on X. Molly, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. And that is a wrap for this week's episode of Amicus. Thank you, as ever, for listening in. And thank you so much for your letters and your comments and your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. And you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sarah Burningham is Amicus's senior producer. Our producer is Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. And we will be back with another episode of Amicus next week. And until then, hang on in there. <laughs>